great. Well, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to wait another uh, 30 to 60 seconds to make sure everyone gets in from the waiting room. So uh, we'll get started in another uh, 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, as we wait for the waiting room to empty out, uh, for those who are comfortable doing so, uh, certainly no obligation. But for those who are comfortable doing so, uh, let John and I know in the chat where you're joining us from uh, this afternoon or this evening. Uh, we're, uh, we're curious where our audience is. Uh, and uh, we'll get started in about 15 seconds. Just wanna make sure everyone gets in before we officially start. Uh, I will note that we are recording uh, the presentation and we are also streaming live to the uh, Tewksbury, Massachusetts uh, Library uh, Facebook page. Uh, for anyone who registered, you'll be receiving an email from me tomorrow with a um, link to uh, the recording. Uh, and you'll also get a, a link to a feedback survey uh, please take uh, 60 seconds and fill that out so you can look for that in your email uh, tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon, depending on where, you, where, you're, where you're joining us from. Okay, great. Well, why don't uh, we get started? My name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury, Massachusetts Public Library. Uh, I want to thank my counterpart in uh, Tewksbury, England, uh, Anne Careless, who really is the brainchild behind this entire weekend and uh, behind uh, all the programs, both uh, in person over in England and uh, the virtual programs here across the world. Uh, I also wanna thank um, Nathan Allen and Seth Fright for their uh, technical support. Uh, we appreciate uh, their help. Um, so just to note, we're in Zoom webinar mode. Uh, John and I cannot see you or hear you. Uh, if you have a question for John, you're going to want to type that into the Q&A box. If you have a comment for John, you're going to type that into the chat box. And uh, we'll address all comments and questions at the end of John's presentation. Uh, we're going to wrap somewhere between, well, let me put it this way, since we're all in different time zones. Uh, I anticipate the program lasting approximately an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, John will give his presentation uninterrupted, uh, and then we'll, as I said, take questions from the audience via the chat. Uh, that just about does it. So let me uh, introduce John here. Uh, as uh, Tewksbury, England celebrates its lights, the 900th anniversary of its unique abbey, uh, John Dixon, who's the life president of the Tewksbury, England Historical Society, will present a Zoom lecture. Uh, he'll analyze the historical development of Tewksbury via its religious affiliations, its main buildings, its transport changes, its industries, and its links with America. And a fun fact before I turn it over to John is John uh, let me know that about 20 to 25 years ago, John actually led a group of uh, Tewksbury, England residents uh, here to Massachusetts. So he's not a complete stranger to us. Uh, so everyone who's watching uh, live on Zoom, whether it be in England or here in America or maybe in Canada, uh, let's give a big virtual round of applause to John for joining us here today. And uh, John, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert, and good evening uh, from England, and good afternoon to uh, Massachusetts uh, on this. It's a grey day in England, but we hear the fall is beautiful in Massachusetts, which I remember so well from 1998. So uh, very, very pleased to be with you. Now, November is quite a busy month in Tewkesbury. Uh, as you'll see on the screen there, we've recently had a very special light event where uh, this is the Abbey of Tewkesbury and all the lights were put on and also the history of the town was presented in lights in the actual nave and you're actually looking at the nave now of the, the church and that was wonderful and then again in a week's time we turn on our Christmas lights to give some brightness over Christmas until Epiphany on the 5th of January 2022, and everybody can enjoy a bright lights of, at night in Tewkesbury. So it's a good month for us. And today, of course, it's been very important. We call it Remembrance uh, Sunday. You call it you called it Veterans Day on the 11th, which we celebrate, commemorated as well. 
So this is this is us. This is I'm very pleased to see you tonight. And I'm going to try and show you how what a contrast that Tewkesbury, England, is with Tewkesbury, Massachusetts. Certainly, I haven't visited Tewkesbury, New Jersey. My colleague Anne Bartholomew brought a group there after I went to Massachusetts. So sadly, I haven't been to New Jersey, but it, I, I'm sure that it's very much of a contrast with our old Tewkesbury in, in, in Gloucestershire. And that's what I hope to show you tonight, because I was quite surprised when I got to Massachusetts, how different the townships are there compared with here. So here we go. And of course, this is a famous picture of our two things, of course, our wonderful Abbey, 900 years old as we speak, and of course, the floods, which have been with us for much longer than 900 years and will always be with us into the future, I'm sure. So the Abbey and the Flute, it's very much something we have to, it's a perennial problem, it's something in Shakespeare we, we have to learn to live with, to accept and to thrive on it. And there it is, that's the worst day in Tewkesbury's history, I would say, because that's the terrible floods we had in um, 2007. We've had floods for many, many years in Tewkesbury, some worse than others. This was the worst one of all. And this was taken from a newspaper which we have called Hello Magazine. I don't know if it's, you get it in America, I don't know, but it's a very glossy magazine. And this went around the world, this picture. And you will notice, ladies and gentlemen, how well they chose the place of the Abbey, because the Abbey, touch wood, never floods, never has flooded so far. And uh, the, only bit, the only bit that does flood is, is the crypt where some of the graves were kept. And we did see uh, the bones of um, the Duke of Clarence, who was murdered in a butt of Malmsey wine. His bones were floating around, they were on the floods, but they've been, it's now been sanitized and it won't happen again. So look how small Tewkesbury is, Tewkesbury, England, how compact it is. Everything is crushed together. Everybody lives together with very little space. And what you see in the background is the mighty River Severn, the longest river. It's our Mississippi, if you like, the mighty River Severn. And it's joined by the, the River Avon, which comes from William Shakespeare's town and joins us here. And in the front there, the dirty water you see in the front is a lot of the modern streams which come down from the Cotswold Hills, too many houses up there, and the rivers come down, they can't get into the mighty seven, and so we get these terrible floods. So there we are, 2007, we don't want to see a repeat of that. This gentleman, you might, he's very much sort of 18th century dress. Um, I'm trying to get rid of this, Robert. I hope you can't see it, but this is our town crier. And, uh, Mike Keen Price, wonderful man who does his job as a part-time job, really, and he keeps the town informed of the main events. And he was on parade today, of course, in his uniform. And he also is very proud of the fact that he's visited all six Gloucesters in America between the years 1999 and 2005. So he, he is very, very keen on... Um, links with, with, with America, and some of you, I'm sure, will remember him. He's unforgettable. And just to show you, we do have this wonderful sculpture, <clears throat> which is very much American, which was given to us by, by the Americans in recent years. It's called Touching Souls, and of course, this is the touching of Tewkesbury souls, the one that you spell without the E, the one that we spell with the E. So very much a, a link together. And, and it's, it's a beautiful sculpture, which the modern tourists absolutely love. And that is just outside the Abbey. And that's the Bell Hotel, which we shall talk about later. Uh, so the Abbey, the history of the Abbey. The, our Abbey is pretty well unique in England because most of the abbeys on the map of England, you will visit it. They will be ruins left in that by the agents of the, the, the King Henry VIII, who, of course, for his own reasons, partly marriage, partly dynastic, he wished to take all the wealth of the abbeys and he destroyed most of them in the country. But he did not destroy Tewkesbury because Tewkesbury was bought 
by the people of the town. Uh, and they knew that Henry VIII was only interested really in money. And so, if you like, we bribed him. We paid him £453. And that was the value of the lead on the roof and the bells in the tower. And so it's still our parish church today. I was in it this morning for our Veterans Day services. A wonderful, as you hope you'll see, a wonderful abbey. Uh, the only thing that was destroyed was the Lady Chapel, which was there. The Lady Chapel was one of the last chapels built in the 15th century and was regarded as far too Catholic in taste for the more puritanical-minded people who took over the Church of England in, in the 16th century. So apart from that, the abbey is, as it was left, the, all the cloisters where the monks live, of course, have gone, but the abbey is a wonderful monument. But it hasn't always been like that. Uh, it's not a very good pitch for you there, but we used to have a spire. And uh, there you can see a, a, a spire on the abbey amidst the floods there. And we had that spire until 1558, when there was a storm, a visitation from heaven, if you prefer it that way, and the spire was knocked down by a bolt of lightning. Um, and so, and it was a very good timing when it happened, because in 1558, our Queen Mary died, and she was, of course, was our last Catholic monarch. And daughter of Henry VIII, her last Catholic daughter died, and she was replaced by her half sister, Queen Elizabeth, who was not of a Catholic persuasion. So we do think perhaps the destruction of the spire was a warning from the Almighty that he was not pleased. But of course, we 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 can look at that in two ways. Some of the things you will see on our Abbey. Um, and well, you won't see that anymore because that's been swept away by these beautiful gates. And if you ever visit our abbey, the chances are you'll walk through these gates. They're called the Gage Gates, named after a, 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 a member of parliament for Cheeksbury who was not famous at all in the country, not a very good MP. But we do have a wonderful tradition in England, or it doesn't happen anymore, and it should do, is that an MP gives a present to the town to thank us for letting him represent us. And the Dowdswells on the left there, they built those gates to, to, to thank us for electing him. But when we got General Gage, he, he made these wonderful gates, uh, as you see on the right-hand side there. And I'm afraid the Dowdswell gates were swept into oblivion. And they're now at a school not far from Chukchi, but very few people see them. But these Gage gates are absolutely beautiful. We ought to remind our MP of that tradition. The other thing to, which is remarkable about Tewkesbury is because we had this wonderful abbey, it was a, a Catholic town, uh, we was always swarming with what we call dissenters. They're people who oppose not only the Catholic Church, but also our own Church of England, uh, the Puritans, if you like. And uh, we have a Baptist church in Tewkesbury, one of the earliest in the country, which was 1623. And uh, you can visit it today. It's a museum, of course, and, and that's the inside of it with the pulpit there because it was sola verba, wasn't it? Everything was depending on the, on the word of the Bible. And in the front there, you'll see uh, the back where the adults could baptize them, be baptized in the faith of the church. And uh, that was a very important um, testimony to Tewkesbury being very much a town that encouraged, if you like, nonconformity. And we still have that tradition today. We also had one of the earliest Quaker chapels in, in England. And George Fox, the great Quaker uh, who started the Quaker movement off, came to Tewkesbury to preach here and that was the first chapel that was built it was just a house as you see there a typical medieval house taken over by the the quakers they also used the garden for their own uh, quaker burial ground there's no headstones there and today it's just an, a lovely quiet part of Tewkesbury where you can go and contemplate 
and that's the Quaker burial ground. And the Quakers were very, very powerful people in the town. They were, off, a lot of them were tanners uh, making leather and very well off. And they took a leading part as, as um, citizens of the town, but they were often taken before the courts because they refused to pay rates to the Church of England. And so these rich men, these powerful men, had to pay fines for not paying their church rates until 1829 in our history, when the Catholics also were emancipated in that, in that year. So this is our Quaker tradition. Of course, the Quakers do not believe in, in, in warfare. And so it's, it's a very interesting part of Tewkesbury's history. Now, we are very much a medieval town, as you will probably see, but we're very much a planned medieval town. And there I show you what the plan of the Tewkesbury looked like in 1798. You will notice all sorts of, well, there are three, there are three streets in Tewkesbury. It's very, you don't get lost in Tewkesbury, it's very easy. There's the church, of course, which dominates the town. Uh, the church is wealth, per permeates through the town, and it's always dominated the town since uh, in the 900 years it's been there. But we have three main streets. That's one we call Church Street. And that joins up with Worcester Road, because Worcester is the next big important abbey to the north of Tewkesbury. And that's the road to London via Stow. And they all meet in Tewkesbury. And at that place, which we call the Cross, we built our war memorial, which you will see later. If you look very closely in the, on the map, you'll see there's lots of rectangular plots. They're called burgage plots. They were for rich people to, to grow their own crops and be self-sufficient. But in the 19th, so 18th century, 19th century, they made far more money for uh, letting, it, for using their plots of land to build cottages for poor people without water, without toilets, but they did yield rent. Now, we do like American visitors here, and uh, we welcome them over many years, and it's been part of the reason why Tewkesbury has been um, prosperous in some ways. And we have one very important uh, author who's known John Moore. Now, I don't know if you've heard of him in America, but if you ever come to England, to Tewkesbury, you must read John Moore's Portrait of Elmbury, which is a very affectionate, humorous study into the life of the poor people and the rich people, of course, in Tewkesbury in the 19th and early 20th century. Wonderful book. And we do have another book about, which is very popular, which was very popular in, in America. And I'd love to ask, ask the audience now, perhaps you'll comment later, if you still read John Halifax, Gentleman. Now, in 1929, John Moore, oh, Robert's shaking his head, I'm sorry to see that. John Moore made some rude comments about John Halifax, gentleman. It's a wonderful economic asset to the town. Why the uneducated American loves it. John Moore was very opinionated. It's difficult to explain. Let me here differentiate clearly between him and the educated America, which, of course, Robert is, who is rarely seen on our shores. It is a curious fact that this strange product of modern civilization respects John Halifax. Most of all, he's gods and idols, perhaps his connection with the word gentleman. And, of course, John Halifax was a Quaker, and he was a Quaker tanner as well. And I, I don't want to upset you because you're all well-educated Americans here, but the uneducated American is a board snob. He flocks eagerly every summer to see where his idol lived, and Tewkesbury reaps a rich harvest from him. In fact, John Halifax is a monument of dullness. That's, and I'd be interested to know how many of you read it. It is dull, but I think it's very worthy. Its characters are as lifeless as clay, and its sentiments so sugary, so sickly sweet, that not even the author's straightforward prose could breathe life into the book. Well, actually, I enjoyed the book. I thought it was a, a wonderful, uh, if you like, uh, demonstration of, of the morality of mid-Victorian England. Uh, we are told Americans still come to find John Halifax. Put me right later, please. And um, it's written by a lady called Mrs. Crake, whose other name was Diana Mullock. 
She only came to Tewkesbury for one afternoon in the 19th century. She fell in love with the town and all the buildings. And she went back to her posh home in Cheltenham nearby and she wrote this romantic story about John Halifax, who was a very poor boy, who because he was so, uh, his morality was so high, he learned how to make money in a moral way and he became a very important uh, dominant person in the town. And so it's a very much... Um, a Victorian moral tale. There's Mrs. Mullock's um, memorial in our abbey, which you can see if you go and visit it. And uh, this is the part of the town that she knew well. This is the Bell Hotel, which is where our pilgrims used to stay when they, when they visited the abbey. Um, it's what we call a public house today. And uh, hotel and that's what it looked if you come today that's what it looked like in 1900 it hasn't really changed much since then it looks very much as a Tudor building or Jacobean building should look as I'll explain to you a little bit later don't be taken in by the facades in Tewkesbury this was very much a fashion around 1900 to put black and white boards on the front of their buildings but the Bell, Bell Hotel does go back to 1696 and uh, pilgrims stayed there way back into the Middle Ages. And this is where the Americans, we believe, used to come and visit. This was said to be Abel Fletcher's Mill, and it's all written over your side. You could buy your, you could have a cup of coffee, buy your antiques and souvenirs. And we used to hope the Americans would come here and spend their dollars. And as you see, in the 1930s, British tourists as well, Birmingham is very near to Tewkesbury, it's only 50 miles away, and it was a lovely Sunday afternoon out. So that's what it used to look like. And there it tells us how we're trying to attract the tourists. And then we move to our centre of the town, the cross, as I called it, where the three roads meet. And this is our, our war memorial in the town. We very rarely get snow here, by the way, so this is quite a unique photograph, which actually reveals snow, no traffic either, and never ever today, except on two days a year, don't try and walk to our war memorial because you'll be killed by the traffic, it's terrible. But today, we do stop the traffic. And this was a scene of, from 12 o'clock today in Tewkesbury, in our after our remembrance service, we all go to the Abbey first of all, we have a service there. Then we march to the memorial. And on this memorial, there are about 200 men and one woman killed in the First World War. 32 men and one woman who was killed in World War II. And also we lost one in 1972 in uh, Northern Ireland. And we lost one in 1982 in the Falklands Isles. We didn't lose any men in Korea, although, of course, the Glorious Gloucestershire's fought very bravely there. But I have interviewed a man who was a prisoner from that war. And sadly, of course, he's passed on now because of life. But there you can see, we, this is a very, very important part of Tewkesbury's life. We stopped the traffic, which is a wonderful thing. And everybody comes to, I think the whole town comes out. Uh, you see the, the uh, armed servicemen there, the veterans on the right there with their flags, the young cadets in front of the memorial. And just to the left here, you've got these young children who are in the guides or the brownies. Everybody becomes involved. It's very much part of the moral education of the youngsters of the town. So that's what we were doing at, at 12 o'clock today. It was not a very nice day. You see how cloudy it is and no evidence of the fall in that picture. No trees there either. So let's go back to Tewkesbury now. Why it was such a wealthy town? And Tewkesbury was at its wealthiest in the year 1788, which was 54 years after Tewkesbury, Massachusetts was formed under the reign of our George II. Well, 1788 was the year in which George III, our king, whom I don't think is too popular in America because he was the one you rebelled against in the War of Independence. He's having a bit of a, a, a restoration now. We tend to think he was not as bad as perhaps people painted him. Uh, 
But we were very, very well off. Oh, the other thing I ought to tell you is, of course, he came in 1788, and very soon after his visit to Tewkesbury, he went mad, allegedly. And what the connection was between Tewkesbury and his madness, I would not like to say. But why were we so powerful and wealthy in 1788? It was because of the coaching trade. And there you can see a male coach. Uh, it's a restoration. They're in front of, of a male, a, a, an inn, a coaching inn there. And of course, people needed to stop for the night. They needed to rest their horse. They needed to rest themselves. They needed to eat and drink and be merry. And we had 30 coaches a day coming through Tewkesbury in the early 19th century, bringing great wealth to town. And that all stopped like a guillotine in 1840, when the railway came to Tewkesbury, which I shall explain in a minute. But there we see a reenactment in 1928 of the Pickwick Papers. Now you all know, I'm sure the Americans still read Dickens. Are you going to nod, Robert? Dickens? Yes, you do, still good. And the Pickwick Papers is uh, one of his more famous books. And in the Pickwick Papers, he actually visited Tewkesbury. He stayed at one of our coaching inns, and he had a wonderful meal there with his uh, servant. And uh, they got so drunk and well-fed that on the way back, they were traveling from Bristol to Birmingham. On the way back to Birmingham, they were placed in the dickey, which of course is the trunk, if you like, of the coach. And they just sang songs merrily all the way to Birmingham that day. And uh, so it's features in the Pickwick Papers. And we used to have a very important society in Tewkesbury called the Dickens Society, but that disappeared in the 1950s. Uh, British people have not got the concentration to read the books of the length of Pickwick again, I'm afraid. It's a, a, sad, uh, a sad note. And this is this wonderful town hall that was built in this most important year of 1788. And uh, there it is in the high street. It's still the site of government in the town and where our local councillors meet and make the decisions about the town. Not the really important decisions because they're made at a higher level now, I'm afraid. But this is when, until 1974, Tewkesbury ruled its own lives, its own government, uh, and much more powerful than the Tewkesbury Parish Council is today. But that's another matter. So there's our wonderful uh, town hall opened in 1788. And that's, of course, when King George went mad the year later. Now, again, I warn you about, and don't be taken in by this beautiful so-called Tudor, uh, Tudor um, buildings. I would say never trust facade. And once so elegant, now so common. But um, there's one of the used to be a famous building in Tewkesbury, very attractive because of its black and white appearance, uh, owned by Moores, who were the most important auctioneers in the town, were mayors of the town, very, very important. But they've disappeared now, of course. And one of the most respected architecture historians in the country, he described it as the horribly restored number 46. And... Uh, and this, this is what it looks like today. On the, it's, it's, you'll like it because it's uh, called the Subway, which I think is very much an American company, which is popular here. And they bought that building and they've taken all that black and white um, facade away. And it looks like a modern building. But you all know about the Turin Shrine, I'm sure, which is uh, where, where Jesus' um, image appears uh, to those who believe it in Italy. Well, this is Tewkesbury's Turin Shroud. Subway very carefully painted the building uh, cream, but you see, you cannot keep a good building down. You look very carefully that that black and white medieval building is coming out through the paintwork. And I'm sure they won't afford to paint it again. And I'm sure it'll end up perfectly black and white in a few years. So that's quite an important building. So thanks, Subway, for that. Yeah, there you go. And that's uh, another, this is, uh, well, it's called the Tudor House. This is the home where John Moore was brought up. He was a 
he was born into wealth. It didn't last for long. His, his father died early and he was brought up in relative poverty. But there's the Tudor house where he was brought up. And everybody would come to the town and think what a beautiful Tudor building it was. Well, it wasn't. Because Pe Pe Pevner again said that in 1897, John Moore's father had the facade suffered with the indignity of being covered with floorboards. Now, Pevsner is a very uh, respected architectural historian. You always have to consult Pevsner. And he was very insulting about our Tudor house. And in a way, he was right, because that's what it looked like before the floorboards were tacked on. And although it's not as superficially attractive as the building today, uh, it has a, a stolidity uh, and respectability, which I think is a shame that we've lost. And in many ways, it was a very important building because it was an academy for Presbyterians, for, for nonconformists in the 18th century. One of our Archbishop of Canterbury was actually educated in that school. But no, it's the Tudor house today, and it's a hotel across. Now, this is a very important building in Tewkesbury. Now, you had your, um, your Birmingham tea, Boston Tea Party, of course, which uh, changed your history. This, in a, if, in a way, is Tewkesbury's Boston Tea Party moment, because this was a um, cafe in Tewkesbury known as the Dodo, after an Anglo-Saxon thane. And this is where the wealthy people in Tewkesbury used to like to come and have tea and crumpets in the daytime. And it was also a restaurant in the evening. And uh, as you see there, it, uh, as the town clerk said, it was horribly restored in 1913. It was made to look Tudor or Jacobean. And that same... Uh, Town clerk wanted to modernise Tewkesbury. Tewkesbury was a very poor town by World War II. And the buildings were, were, were very poor standard. They were seen to be falling down. And this town clerk had an idea to bring Tewkesbury screaming into the 20th century by building a, a, a new shopping centre, shopping precinct in the town. And to do that, they had to knock down that building. And the good people of Tewkesbury, who used to enjoy tea and crumpet there, they staged a rebellion and formed the Civic Society, which even today makes sure you cannot change buildings in Tewkesbury without gaining permission. One of the buildings they knocked down was, was, was Sally Watkins Cottage. Now, again, if you've read the John Halifax, you'll want to come and find Sally Watkins Cottage. Well, I'm sorry, it's gone. It's been removed by a precinct. Other buildings were knocked down, as you see there. Again, never trust a facade in Tewkesbury, even if it was a Georgian facade from the 18th century. You look behind it and you'll see Tudor medieval buildings, but they were not very beautiful, were they? That's why they were knocked down. You could spend money on them, they'd be fine. And this is what the Tewkesbury High Street used to look like uh, before the precinct was built. Nothing particularly beautiful, higgledy-piggledy, different standards, different styles. You can see that the Dodo there, uh, standing out there with its with its uh, gable there, but well, all that was swept away for this new precinct. And there it is in all its beauty and wonder. Ah, dear, dear, dear. We still can't believe how we would have given permission for that to be built, but it was very typical 1970s. And it was built, and it is quite prosperous today. People shop there, I shop there. Not much choice, really. Uh, but uh, there it was. But the people at Chicksby, they call it the Kremlin, which is a big insult to that lovely medieval building in Moscow. If they called it the Lubyanka, then I think we'd have all understood that. So that's what replaced the old buildings of Chicksby. Now, there's one new building in Chicksby I will praise the architect of, and that is our town library. It was built in 1983 to harmonise with historic, historical buildings. I'll point out, on the right-hand side, all the red brick there, red brick was all made, uh, bricks were made by the River Severn in, in Tewkesbury and looked like that, they always have done, the red brick. However, you look above the library in Gloucester name there, you can see the black and white upper floor of the uh, the library 
it's offices of an architect, and that's one of the best views in the town. But you can see there it's black and white to reflect those buildings. And that bell at the top is very important historically because it's the bell tower from, we used to have cattle markets in Tewkesbury. I wonder if Tewkesbury, Massachusetts had cattle markets, but farmers used to drive their cattle from the countryside into the town two days a week to sell in the cattle market in Tewkesbury and the bell there would control the activities there. And so they rescued that bell, they put it on the library and I love our library. I hope Anne Curlis is listening tonight. Um, it's it's one of the, a nice piece of architecture and it's lovely to work in as well. Super library. And that's what was replaced. That's what it used to look like. Look how crowded Tewkesbury was. Everybody cheek by jowl. All different styles of houses, Georgian, medieval, Victorian. Uh, also, also strange, it's all been swept away now by that, which is our precinct. Yeah. And a lot more space now, of course, for parking lots. We have to have our parking lots. Tewkesbury, uh, Tewkesbury actually, the, the, the big council that controls Tewkesbury today, which we call the district council or the borough council, most of their income comes from parking fees collected in Tewkesbury, which the people of Tewkesbury are not too keen about because they're expensive. But there is the, what it looks like today. This is the modern centre of Tewkesbury, although, of course, it's always changing. Sadly, that uh, swimming pool, which we used to love in Tewkesbury, that's been swept away and a new one's been built elsewhere. So there you go. Change is it a good thing. Now, you're, not, you're probably not aware that Tewkesbury is a famous railroad capital. Well, it isn't. <sighs> Tewkesbury knew that as soon as the railway was opened in 1840, Tewkesbury's prosperity would be ruined. All the coaching inns would go bust, all the people who worked with the coaches would lose their jobs, and it happened. Prosperity collapsed overnight in 1840. And all we got, the main line used to go from Bristol to Birmingham and bypass Tewkesbury because no self-suspecting railway engineer would buy, would build a railway line anywhere near Tewkesbury because of the floods. It would be an be a economic uh, nightmare, really. So they gave us a branch line at right angles to the main line, which came to the docks in Tewkesbury and stopped on the high street. And for some reason, which we really don't understand even today, they built us this beautiful station on the high street. Now, if any of you know St Pancras Station in London, John Gilbert Scott, one of the most beautiful buildings in England, I think this is the second most building next to St Pancras. Absolutely beautiful. Built in 1838, never made any money. And we don't know why this photograph was taken, because steam engines were not allowed to come this side of that arch. And if you look very carefully, you can see to get that engine through the arch, they've had to chip away at the masonry, which is a terrible thing to have done. But there you go. We think that picture is about 1864, but it's a beautiful building. And it just disappeared in 1929, and the newspapers didn't talk about it. It was such a non-event, it disappeared. Tewkesbury, you would expect Tewkesbury to be famous for boat building, would you not? Because we're on these two main rivers, this Severn and the Avon. And this, we had a, one of the fam famous industrialists of the Victorian period, Bathurst. They came down from the, from the Ironbridge Gourd, yeah, when they came here, they built these beautiful boats out of wood. And I'm sure you'll agree, ladies and gentlemen, that is a scene of absolute tranquility and beauty there. And uh, those boats used to plough along the River Severn, especially benefiting ordinary people who were getting more holidays and a little more wealth at the end of the 19th century. And they would go for a, a trip on a Sunday on the rivers and thoroughly enjoy it. So Bathurst started building... And these boats were built in about 1900. This, I'm afraid, is not Tewkesbury. This is Eversham, which is nearby on the Avon. But we did a lot of good work in World War II. As you know, in America, your prosperity, post-war prosperity, was generated by what happened in World War II, and it spread to England as well. And Bathurst, the, the yacht builders, 
they started to build warships. And that doesn't look very, it's not a big warship, of course, because it's be too small. It could have been a motor torpedo boat, or it could have been a harbour defence vessel. But they were built in Tewkesbury and brought prosperity to Tewkesbury in World War II, which continued after the war. And he he was building boats out of wood. There was a new uh, there was a new method of building boats in the 1960s and 70s, which was fiberglass. And the man who pioneered fiberglass boat building in Tewkesbury was somebody called. Bill Shakespeare. Now, he is our Bill Shakespeare. He's not your Bill Sh William Shakespeare. He's our Bill Shakespeare. And he, but he, but he, he knocked off a lot of water speed records, but sadly, he tried to destroy another record in 1971, and he was killed doing that. And that's the last picture of Bill Shakespeare before his boat flipped over and he was never seen again. A very, very important man in Tewkesbury. He he resurrected the boat building industry in Tewkesbury. He pioneered fiberglass boating, and sadly, his life was taken away 50 years ago last month. We don't have a boat building industry now, of course. And this, this is a bit of a sore point for us in England, and we can be a little bit shirty with the Americans about this. Because this was our famous steam-powered mill, Healings Mill, which... Um, converted great wheat into flour and shipped it all over the southwest of England. It was powered by steam engines, one of the first in the country. Eventually it was converted to electric power and it was very, very clean. I, I, I visited that in the 1970s and I could not believe I was in a flour mill, it was so clean. And it, it gave employment to generations of people in Tewkesbury. But I'm afraid rationalization came in 2016 and an American firm from Chicago bought Healings Mill. They closed it down very, very quickly and they shipped all the useful machinery down to Avonmouth near Tewkesbury. There was, a, there was an economic logic to it, I suppose, in the bigger picture, but it's ruined the employment prospects of 40 workers that lost their jobs. And we don't know what to do with it. Today, it looks like that. We There's been plans to convert it. We think this part, the best part of the mill, the 1865 part, will be converted into apartments. But the ground floor, which will be the car park, will have to be shared with the floods. It will flood. This is one of the worst buildings ever built in Tewkesbury by our local builder called Collins. If you look here, you can see it's been... Um, shored up with steel for the last hundred years and I think that will have to be knocked down before they can actually use the site but it's it does distress everybody in Tewkesbury to see this rotting corpse of this once vibrant industry we had in Tewkesbury. Now this is a famous American in Tewkesbury or was in Tewkesbury and I wonder if you've heard of her in America. Victoria Woodall Martin, American citizen, long resident in this neighborhood who devoted herself unsparingly to all that could promote the great cause of Anglo-American friendship. And she was born in 1838 and died in 1927. And this of course was, the, was this plaque was put up in the Second World War when we worked very closely with our American friends. So you've probably never heard of Victoria Woodall Martin. Um, in fact, if you can see at the top there, she was the only woman who was stood as a candidate for the presidency of the United States. And you're probably not aware of this, uh, our American friends, but uh, let me try and explain what it was all about. That's her name, that's her married name, when she was respectable. But she was a very wild girl and she sold her wild oats in a way before she became respectable when she got married. She was born Victoria Claflin, a poor girl in the, I think, in the, in the, in the prairies of, of, of Midwest. She got married, first of all, to a, a Mr. Blood, and therefore her name became Mrs. Blood, and she was infamous at the time. 
a very wild woman, and she was determined to be the first American president. And she started a campaign. You know how difficult it is to become a president in America. It's not easy at all. And she went through a lot of the got she got some rich men to back her and in fact so such a threat was she seen by the men of the time they trumped up a charge against her and the day she had to put in her presidential nominations she was clapped into jail and she never did stand for president in america however she married in 1882 she married a, an englishman called john bidoff martin from a very rich banking family in England, which used to have Martin's Bank, which is now part of Barclays Bank in England. So she married very respectable. And she came to live in England and she became the lady of the manor of a village near, near Tewkesbury called Breeden's Norton. And while there, she did wonderful things for the well for the well-being of the people there. She introduced telephones, electric light, she set up a school for, for, for ladies to learn agricultural skills. She, she was wonderful. And that's why she's a, a very well-respected American in Tewkesbury. But they were going to make a film about her life. And they were going to make Nicole Kidman was going to be Mrs. Woodall Martin. But you can be sure there wouldn't fit, figure much of her life in Breen's Norton in that film. I think they were more invest in in her bad reputation. She was known in America as Mrs. Satan. Books have been written about her. And I think that's what would have been what Nicole Kidman was going to uh, play. And of course, it was Tom Cruise who was going to be our John Biddulph Martin. Hmm. I don't think so. But it never happened. He didn't make the film. It was wasted. But we still have this memory of Mrs. Woodall Martin. The GIs, of course, were very much in evidence in Tewkesbury in World War II. Uh, an agreement was made that um, when the American Operation Bolero came over in 1942, the main base, the main logistical base for the Americans would be at Tewkesbury, at a village called Ashchurch, just outside of Tewkesbury. And in World War II, Ashchurch camp became the main logistical um, base for D-Day. Had the Nazis known about it and bombed it, then D-Day would not have been as successful as it indeed was. So it was never touched in war and it did a wonderful job of uh, keeping the American troops supplied uh, in Europe. And uh, we've had very close relationships with the American veterans. They used to come over nearly every year and meet us. And in, in 1994, on the 50th anniversary of D-Day, we went to visit uh, Ashchurch County just to see what was left of the Americans. And I'm afraid there wasn't a lot to be seen. There was just that one wall with obviously the American insignia there. 1944, the big year, of course, of D-Day. Uh, the V sign for victory. And if you look, you can just see the slogan of the American, this, this unit, the 622 Obama, was keep them rolling, which of course uh, refers not to uh, wagon train, but to keeping the trucks going to the front in Europe. So very, very important. And we had uh, thousands of American servicemen coming through Tewkesbury in World War II. And they had a very significant impact in the town. One impact, which, what now, the other thing is, yes, they always talked about their Yankee ingenuity. They obviously had humour. And these men, who were all engineers, bright blokes, a lot of spare time, because there wasn't any fighting going on around here, they spent their time building that five-man bike because they wanted to go to Tewkesbury, Tewkesbury to buy some of the Americans apparently loved, which is our fish and chips. And so they were, and they they ate the country drier fish and chips in World War II, not just in Chooksbury. So the men would ride on their bike in the evening to Chooksbury, buy their fish and chips, and hopefully ride back to eat them. But old gentlemen now who were young boys from World War II, they remember they loved this picture because they get very excited because in the war they used to kidnap that bike and hold it for ransom from the GIs. 
and they would demand candy in exchange for their bike. And of course, the Americans, as you know, are very good with children, very good reputation the way they treat the children. So they would pay the ransom and they would cycle off back to our church about three miles to enjoy their fish and chips. So there we go. And also, of course, uh, American soldiers fell in love with some of our local girls. And this is my favorite GI. This is Mary Smith, as she was, from Tewkesbury, who fell in love with an American GI. Howard Strombeck, a very handsome man you see there. Uh, he courted her in the war. He actually went, after D-Day, he disappeared with lots of the Americans, and he actually ended up fighting after D-Day, and he was wounded. And he came back to hospital in Southampton, and Mary rushed down to look after him, and uh, their relationship developed and they got married in Tewkesbury Abbey there in 1945. And as you, you're all probably aware, the American government and the British government did not approve of these marriages at all. And it was Eleanor Roosevelt whose campaign actually got these GI brides able to be sent over to America to join their husbands with their 29,000 children. And and when we study the GI experience, although it was a very difficult at times, most of the marriages seem to survive and they come back, of course, to see us at Tewkesbury. Very, very happy now. Uh, Mary's life wasn't quite a happy. Her marriage did end up in, in divorce, but she married a second time near Chicago and she lived very happily until she came back in 2007 as a, after her husband died. There is another side to the American peasants, which did cause some controversy, which I will allude to, because, of course, um, not everybody was allowed to get married. If an American serviceman, who was a, a, an ego serviceman, fell in love with a local girl and wanted to marry her, it was against, of course, the rules in 1944. And the result was what are today called brown babies. And there you see Tewkesbury's famous brown baby, and I'll point you out uh, in this picture there, very smart young man at school in 1953. That could have been my school. Uh, very, very typical, very, very popular lad he was. And I'm going to show you a picture of him now, 18 years later. The ladies might get excited. Because there he is there. A wonderful hunk of a man everybody wanted to play in his football team he was so popular he was so successful with men and women now why are they what's they doing in Tewkesbury they used to have fun in Tewkesbury in the good old days every year they'd have a race around Tewkesbury the men would the, it's all the men I'm afraid would do would, they would make prams out of uh, go-karts if you like and they would dress up as babies like this and one day a year they would race around the town um, in those, and they'd start off in a, the Bell Hotel, would end up in another pub. And the rule was they had to stop at five pubs in the race, down a pint of English beer, which is very strong, of course, and the winner uh, would be deemed the champion. And there you can see Fibo that year was the champion. And that uh, with this lad in front of him. So he was very, very popular indeed. And very happy memories of Fibo, who was left behind in World War II. Modern Tewkesbury. Well, we are now famous for GCHQ, which I'm sure all you Americans are aware of. Very close, um, very close relationship with the Pentagon in America. A lot of people who work at GCHQ do go over to the Pentagon to work. And that's the recent building there. It's been put up. It's called the Donut. If you, if you know the British, oh, you do know about donuts because you know about Dunkin' Donuts. So you know very well it, it is a donut. And, uh, and there it is. I think it's a very vulnerable to an air attack from terrorists, but they don't seem to be bothered about it. But there it is today. And it does, it does provide and has provided a lot of high skilled employment in Tewkesbury since World War II. It, it was Bletchley Park, of course, originally, and they moved over to Cheltenham after the war. And they took over a, an American base in, in Tewkesbury, in, sorry, in Cheltenham, and they built this splendid building about a decade ago. 
And also, we've got another wonderful American company called Moog. I hope you recognise Moog, which is into aerospace, isn't it? Moog's been with us now for, for quite a long time, but they're now investing in a new factory in Tewkesbury on a derelict site. And I think we should be thrilled with what Moog have said with us. Again, as a teacher, I visited Moog with some of my pupils and I was astounded by how clean a factory could be. We could have eaten our, if they'd allowed us, which they wouldn't, we could have eaten our lunches off the floor. Absolutely beautiful. And it gives really good standard of employment for people in Chicksbury. So we do welcome, of course, the £40 million investment of Moog Aerospace. So here we are. We've, we are at the end of our presentation now. Uh, being helped by Ferragas, obviously by our members in Chicksbury Historical Society. And, uh, and I designed this for Chicksbury's Kiss and Kin, our relatives over in America and uh, in both uh, Massachusetts and New Jersey. And I am amazed to hear there is a, a Tewkesbury in Quebec, France. And we've done a special presentation for them, apparently, with a French uh, language commentary on top of it. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for listening tonight. I would love to hear your comments at the end, if you would be kind. So. What do I do now, Robert? So, I'll John, just... I'll take it from here. John, if you I'll either... stop sharing, is that right? That's fine. Sure. There you go. Great. All right. I love the Abbey in the background. Can I ask you two questions before we get to the audience questions? Take yeah. a swig of that water. Okay. Sorry, well, I, I guess... did that. Yeah, I, I actually, I wanted you to expand a little bit about the importance of the Abbey. Um, I, I know you touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but can you talk about the, the history of the Tewksbury Abbey a little more and what, what, uh, why, what, what are we celebrating this year? We're celebrating the 600th, sorry, sorry, the 900th anniversary of its consecration in 1121. It was uh, built by monks from France and... Uh, as were many uh, abbeys in the country. And it was, first of all, of course, it attracted a lot of economic wealth because the abbey needed to be serviced by the local people. They sold their, their food to them and kept them going. And really, the town of Chicksbury grew up because of the location of this very successful abbey here. And of course, they're very important in philanthropy, looking after the poor people of Tewkesbury until the Reformation. And uh, without the Abbey, Tewkesbury wouldn't exist as it does today. It would be totally different. Yeah. And then, John, can you also talk about the historical significance of the Battle of Tewkesbury, which I guess oh, is yes. also celebrating yeah. some sort of anniversary right. this year? Yeah. Y yes, we, yes, because my. Yeah, 1471, so it must be the, uh, oh gosh, is it the 550th anniversary? Yeah, the Battle of, the Wars of the Roses you've all heard of, which was a, a very important series of battles in England between two aristocratic families who wished to become kings of England. And at the time, the, Lan the Lancastrians were the kings of England, Henry VI, but unfortunately, Henry VI was not fit to be king. And... Uh, and the Yorkist, the Duke of York, rebelled against him. And there were a series of battles which went on between um, 17, oh, sorry, 1421, if you like, and 1485. Now, should, the Battle of Tewkesbury in 1471 should have been the last battle in the Wars of the Roses because um, Edward IV, the Yorkist king, took on the... Um, Lancastrian army near Tewkesbury, led, of course, by the, the Mad King's wife, uh, Queen Margaret, who was quite a formidable woman. And Queen Margaret was trying to join her um, allies in Wales. And to do that, they had to cross the River Severn. And everybody blocked the few bridges on the River Severn against the Lancastrians. So they came to Tewkesbury because at that time you could ford or if you like, you could wade over the River Tewkesbury at certain times of the year and certain tides. And that was their hope. They would escape over the river to join their allies in, um, in, uh, in Wales. Some others of them, of course, typical Middle Ages, they sought sanctuary safety in the Abbey. 
And of course, in the Middle Ages, if you got into the abbey and, and sought sanctuary from the abbot there, the king was not allowed to enter the abbey and take his prisoners. Now, the Lancastrians were defeated. A lot of them did escape to the abbey, but I'm afraid that the, something nasty happened in the abbey. Depends which side you are. Uh, the Lancastrians say the Yorkists invaded the abbey and murdered the uh, Lancastrian leaders in the abbey, which is, of course, against all the rules in the medieval period. The Yorkists don't quite say that. They say, no, uh, the, the Lancastrian leaders were arrested in the abbey. Uh, they, were, they took a, a mass together in the abbey. And then on the next day, on the Monday, they took out the Lancastrian leaders and they executed them in a judicial way at the cross in Tewkesbury. And a lot of the Lancastrian leaders, of course, disappeared. And we also lost our prince, the son of King Edward VI, who was Prince Edward, who, had he lived, might have been a good king. But he didn't live and he died. But then, of course, um, we would have had a Yorkist king forever and after that, but we did get another Yorkist king who fought at the Battle of Tewkesbury, that's Richard of York, who became Richard III. And as you know, allegedly, he killed the princes in the tower and then Henry VII came back at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 and defeated the uh, Yorkists and set up the Tudor throne, which is still with us today, really, in, in its different form. So Tewkesbury should have been the last battle of Wars of the Roses, but it isn't. Bosworth has got it. And Bosworth, of course, got the, found the body, didn't they? The skull of, or the bones of Richard III very, very recently. And uh, as, an, as an aside, I hope everything's okay with Queen Elizabeth. I, I was watching the news this ah. morning and um, I guess she had a, a health scare recently and she was supposed to make her first public appearance in a, in a few weeks uh, this morning or maybe this afternoon your time I'm not sure but I guess she sprained her back or something so anyway I, I hope a 95 year young uh, uh, well, Queen Elizabeth we all feel the same she visited us in 1971 she had a special visit which is still remembered by a lot of people in church but I wasn't here then but uh, and uh, yes and so yes we're worried about her we really hope that she will be better soon yeah all right, we'll take a few questions from the audience here, and I encourage folks to type their questions into the chat or the Q&A, and if you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, feel free to uh, write your question there. I'll try to keep tabs on that. I did see that. a message come through that said there is a yep. Tewkesbury in South Africa as well. So, Vicky Heath, you sent the message. You write the history of Tewkesbury in South Africa for us and do a <laughs> talk. Hmm. Yeah, so in addition to South Africa, I think uh, your librarian, er Anne Careless, also identified um, there, there's a Tewksbury in Tasmania, if you can believe that. That doesn't surprise me. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we how ought about to that? link with them, didn't we? We I, try. I would say I, they're probably all convicts, but uh, they wouldn't <laughs> like that. Yeah. Yeah, I know Anne did her best. Uh, I know for some we had language barriers as well. So, uh, so we have a few questions from Philip here. Uh, he wants to know, where is the plaque for Victoria Woodhall Martin? Oh, it's in the Abbey. Yes, you, you'll find it easy to find in the Abbey. Mm. And Philip also asks, um, where were the, and I may mispronounce some of these, where were the uh, Dowds, Dowdswell Gates? You talked about those at the beginning. The Dowdswell family, yes. Yep. The Dowdswell Gates, yes. It, uh, the Dowdswells were a well, landed family who owned... Um, Paul Court near Bushley, which is just a village near Tewkesbury. And Paul Court went bankrupt in 1926 and then became a school which is confusingly called Breeden School, which is a private school today. And the headmaster of Breeden School rescued those gates and he's re erected them in the grounds of Breeden School. So if anybody comes uh, to visit, wants to see the Dowsall gates, I can take you to see them, but they're not as grand as the gauge gates. So, John, if there's someone on the line who's from New Jersey or, or Massachusetts or, or Canada, Quebec, um, when, when is the best time, in your opinion, to visit uh, Tewkesbury, England? Is, is there a better time? Floods can happen at any time. Yeah. And of course, I, I, we do have school visits here and they actually love it when they see the floods. It's, it's a great attraction to them. But uh, the best time, well, you have to come to England, I'm sorry, in the spring and the summer. 
up to the end of September. So say April to September. I'm afraid the, our winters are not severe in any way. They're just dull, wet. Uh, so, but we cannot you cannot predict when the floods are going to happen. We have a question on Facebook. Uh, some, <laughs> this is somewhat of a joke, but uh, uh, they would like to know. So one of the complaints here in Massachusetts, in our Tewksbury, is that we have um, not, not the best uh, main roadways. Some of our roadways are in poor condition. And they were wondering, what is the condition of your roadways in your Tewksbury? <laughs> uh, yeah, most of the, the ordinary roads where we live, the potholes are bad. Yes. But um, we do have, of course, what we call a motorway very near, which goes from Birmingham down to Bristol, which took a lot of traffic out of Tewkesbury in the 1970s. And uh, our main problem here is we're, we're getting a lot of building of homes and factory outlets, shopping and that sort of thing. But they don't really build enough of the infrastructure to, to cope with the traffic that will be generated. I hope that's a fair answer. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, that's uh, actually something arguably that our Tewksbury uh, shares as well. Uh, and then, John, can you briefly speak to the demographics of your Tewksbury? Uh, what's your population size and sort of how, how would you describe your population? Yeah, around about 20,000. It's very difficult to be definitive because the town of Tewksbury now, of course, has expanded into lots of little villages mm -hmm. uh, around, like Ashchurch we talked about. So uh, the actual town of Tewkesbury is about 25,000, but the, the bigger area probably goes up to 30,000, 40,000 now. And it's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. When they build the new... When you come again in the future, Ash Church Camp, where the Americans were, will be joined by buildings, including Moog, all the way into Tewkesbury. And our big worry is that people will come and shop at this new shopping precinct, shopping outlet, and they won't bother to come into Tewkesbury and spend their money on our lovely shops in Tewkesbury. And uh, John, what is the big uh, sport in, in Tewkesbury, if you had to choose one? Would it be football, our, our version of soccer? Uh, no, rugby is... Rugby. Uh, we, yeah. It's very co controversial. I've got to be careful here. But <laughs> the rugby club is, is a very good club. We do have good football as well. And, of course, we have a, a town cricket team as well. So I would say you, you can you can participate in whichever sports you like in Tewkesbury. Very keen amateur ethos in Tewkesbury for joining in. Sure. So... Yes, I might upset some people by saying that. That's okay, John. Um, so I think I have asked all the questions that's come in via Zoom and via Facebook. Um, so, John, well, why don't we wrap it up here? Do you, do you have any last words for the group uh, before we end the webinar? No, uh, the only snag, of course, is with webinars. I can't see you and I don't feel you and I can't interact with you, which is a great shame. But uh, so can you... Thank you very much for listening tonight. Um, if anybody remembers me in Massachusetts for my visit in 1998, I do thank you for your welcome. And I'm sure people have moved on since then. But uh, no, it was a very happy visit. And yeah, I'm sorry I never got to New Jersey. Well, may maybe you can make a return visit to Massachusetts, or at least maybe some of Massachusetts folks can visit you, John. So uh, we'll see what happens in the future. But I want to thank John Dixon. Wonderful presentation, as expected. I also want to thank Anne Careless uh, of the Tewksbury UK Library for organizing this. And I also want to thank uh, Nathan Allen and Seth Fright for their tech uh, technical support. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks thank again, you. John. Everyone thank have a great afternoon much. and a great evening. Thank you. I will leave you now. Great. Bye, John.